Hey, what's going on, dudes? My name is Rex, and we are back with some more Elder Scrolls Skyrim. On the last episode, we did Periati's quest. We went into Bitharms? I'm not sure how to pronounce that. Bitharms. <laughs> Such a weird name. And uh, we did the quest where we had to kill uh, or Kendall or Chindle. And uh, we got a reward from Periati, which was... I don't think I actually showed it on the last episode. The Spellbreaker! Even though uh, I didn't show it last episode, we actually talked in great length about this weapon, about the Rorikin clan, which is the, the Dwemer group that actually made the weapon. And uh, we also talked about what possible connection the Dwemers might actually have with this Daedric Prince, which wasn't really much. Today, we're going to be going to our next destination, which is the Daedric Prince Meridia. He's, uh, she's one of the, I think, personal favorites of most people, I would say. Uh, she's one of the cool ones, is what I like to say. But uh, she's a little bit of an enigma. We don't really know much about her. We don't even know what her true portfolio is, right? Like, we know... We know that there are Daedric Princes of Chaos, Daedric Princes of Madness, Daedric Princes of War, Daedric Princes of Pestilence and Disease, right? Like, we typically know what a Daedric Prince is all about. That is the first thing that we are told, normally speaking. Uh, for Meridia, that is not really the case. We know that she exemplifies the light. We know that she exemplifies life. And that she is specifically the antithesis of undeath. She hates undeath. She Look hates. Look at my temple lying in ruins. So much for the constancy of mortals, their crafts and their hearts. If they love me not, how can my love reach them? Don't you find that weird? In here, we have a Daedric Prince of life, of light. A Daedric Prince that, literally, you just saw, talks about love. How can her love not reach people? After everything that you know this about Daedric Gods... After everything that you know about Daedric Princesses, and after just a small amount of detail that I have given you with Meridia, does that make any sense to you? She is wholly different to any other form of Daedric Prince. I mean, honestly, literally look at any of them. Because even Jigalag, which was sort of like the closest that you could find to like a good Daedra outside of Meridia, he was just insane. So crazy that the other Daedras just had to destroy him, right? Meridia, on the other hand, sits here. She is the owner of Dawnbreaker, the Sword of Light, literally a sword of paladins and crusaders. She destroys the undeath. And she shows herself as an angel, but not as an evil angel, not like a dark or kind of crazy, ambiguous angel. And no, she is actually like a real angel. Let's just first talk about her before we go any further. But look at this. Look at the symbolism. Does this make any sense to you? It is time for my splendor to return to sky. But the token of my truth lies buried in the ruins of my once great temple. Now tainted by a profane darkness skittering within. The necromancer Malkaren defiles my shrine with vile corruptions. Trapping lost souls left in the wake of this war to do his bidding. Worse than... He uses the power stored within my own token to fuel his foul deeds. I have brought you here, mortal, to be my champion. You will enter my temple, retrieve my artifact, and destroy the defiler. 
Hmm. Tell me more about this artifact. Mortals call it Dawnbreaker, for it was forged in a holy light that breaks upon my foes, burning away corruption and false life. You will enter my shrine, destroy Malkarin, and retrieve this mighty blade. Hmm. Doesn't really sound like I have a choice in the matter. But a single candle can banish the darkness of the entire void. If not you, then someone else. My beacon is sure to attract a worthy soul. But if you are wise, you will heed my bidding. Go now. The artifact must be reclaimed. And Malkarin destroyed. Malkarin has forced the door shut. But this is my temple, and it responds to my decree. I will send down a ray of light. Guide this light through my temple, and its doors will open. And there we go. This does not sound like any Daedra that I know. See, that is because she is no Daedra. Meridia is actually an Aedra. A, a god, as you would know it. Like Akatosh. Like Kinnereth. Like Stendar. She was actually one of them. But then the question becomes, well, why, why is she a Daedra? And that's where, uh, whew, that's where the questions really lie, and there really aren't many answers. What we do know about Meridia is that she wanted the creation of Mundus. Mundus, of course, being this this planet. Uh, when the gods wanted to create this place, of course, because Lorcan fooled them into doing so, Meridia was right there with them. She wanted to create this world. But then, of course, Lorcan showed his true colors. He actually sort of wanted to imprison the gods in here and then use their power to fuel the world. And when Magnus realized what was going on, he realized that his powers were being absorbed. Of course, Magnus being the architect of this world, the one who was the true sort of like powerhouse behind the creation of this planet, the one who had all the power. Once he realized what was going on, he left. And in fact, uh, a lot of other Aedras left with him. Actually, let me go ahead and show you something. When Magnus left, he was so powerful, he was so enormous in his magnitude that he had to punch a hole in Mundus, in this planet. And he punched that hole directly through Oblivion and into Aetherius, where he used to live. And that is the sun. The sun in this world is the hole that Magnus left when he left this world. And now the sun is basically almost like a tunnel between this world and Aetherius in a way, and that leftover energy is magic, and that's the magic that everyone uses it, that everyone uses, and it comes from Magnus. Now, the rest of the spirits, the rest of those Aedras, people don't really talk much about them, but they were also, of course, gods, they were also entities, and Meridia was one of those spirits. One of those at Ada that saw that their powers were being absorbed by this planet and they decided to leave. All of those spirits are those stars. Essentially, those stars are holes. Holes made into reality that traverses oblivion into Aetherius. So you can see how many Aedras were actually working towards the creation of this world, but how many of them also left because their powers were being absorbed. Now, of course, some of them stayed, and we know those as the uh, the divines, right? So, again, Stendar, uh, Akatosh, etc., etc. But uh, something made Meridia come back. 
which is the the real question the the question that we do not really have answers for and that's the that's the real incognito here why did meridia come back now her coming back of course allegedly got her banished from from Aetherius. Uh, the uh, the concept being that Magnus wanted to stay away as much as possible from the Daedrus. You know, we know that Daedrus and Aedrus are basically sort of like opposing forces. Um, so when Meridia started to delve deeper and deeper into the Daedric world, Magnus and his folks basically just sort of banished her. Now, why was she doing that? Who knows? Is It's really unknown, but the idea is that Meridia went into Oblivion, carved basically a piece of Oblivion for herself, and in that piece she created her own realm of existence. Now, one of the most interesting things about Meridia is her school, basically, her portfolio, the portfolio of light. The portfolio of life. What is that? Why would she pick that particular portfolio? And who does that remind you of? Is there any other god or Daedra that sort of shares a very similar stance in magic in this world? These guys are gonna be quite annoying to fight, to be honest. God, I love fighting with dual wielding weapons. It's just so fun. It's like speedy. And uh, speedy is nice. The answer is Kinnereth. Kinnereth is the one god that when you start sort of looking at what she's supposed to represent, you will notice that she, she shares a lot of similarities with Meridia. She is, in fact, the one god of light, the god of the sky, right? The god of the air, the god of of the animals, of, you know, basically the elements. Shares a couple of similarities. They're different. For sure they're different. But there's also a lot of similarities be between them. How am I supposed to go to their side? Am I supposed to just keep going? I'm supposed to find my way. It's kind of tricky to do the commentary as you're... <laughs> As you're playing. Uh, the idea is that, you know, there's this hypothesis out there that Meridia and Kinnereth might actually be sisters. That they might actually be sort of made from the same concept. And, you know, it's kind of tricky to uh, entertain these ideas because... The concept of gods in the world of Elder Scrolls, it, it's just not particularly well... Gods are not very well explained in this world. When you read some of the books that deal with like the creation mythos of Elder Scrolls, there's just a lot of metaphors that are used. You know, some metaphors say that this world is sort of all in the head of this enormous entity. That... Anu and Padome basically have these feelings, these emotions, and the Daedrus and the gods are basically manifestations of these emotions, and that this world is all in the head of these entities. You know, that's a metaphor that you get seen, that you, you see a lot in some of these books. The other one is that everything is about music in this world, that... The Twelve Worlds were basically sang into reality and that there is music to everything in the world of Elder Scrolls and that the gods are like specific tunes and um, that to manipulate reality, and, you know, to use magic or to be able to achieve Kim, it's all about understanding the tunes of this world. It's just, it gets really weird. I don't really want to get too into it because it's... It's just, it's just odd. <laughs> All the metaphors that uh, some of the characters use to describe reality in this universe. It, it's just bizarre. But the idea being that whatever is that gods really are, and whatever is that makes them exist, 
Meridia and Kinnereth are basically just formed from the same concept. That they are, for all intents and purposes, sisters. And the idea being that the reason why Meridia came back is going to be a nightmare for me doing this expert level once. Oh my god. <laughs> is that Meridia wanted to actually come back for her, her sister. She didn't want to leave her behind, even though it would kind of force her to abandon the heavens, so to speak. Now this theory is made even more interesting. Ah, uh, there you go. When you remember and you go back to Elder Scrolls Oblivion. In Elder Scrolls Oblivion, in the DLC, Knights of the Nine, <laughs> if you pay attention, you would actually realize that the whole war between Umaril the Unfeathered and Pelinol Whitestrake was really a war between Meridia and Kinnereth. See, Kinnereth literally sent Pelinol Whitestrake into his crusade of conquest. Like, he was her champion, and she was the one that just sort of pushed him towards doing all the things that he did. And, uh, of course, you have the husband of Alessia, who was the slave queen who fought against Umarel as well. The, the army of the rebellion. Uh, Morihouse, which was the, the husband of Alessia, he was the literal son of Kinnereth. Like, his name was Morihouse the Breath of Kine, the Breath of Kinnereth. Like, he literally was a demigod because Kinnereth was his mother. So you, you, you see that, right? And that's one aspect of it. And then you know that, of course, Umaril the Unfeathered was blessed by Meridia, was protected by Meridia, and was also considered to be partly a demigod because of that. You put those points together and you realize that, yeah, it was, technically speaking, Kinnereth versus Meridia. Now, isn't that interesting? That is just honestly like... Kind of just... I don't know, it, it puts a lot of things into context. Might explain a few things, but creates more questions than it really answers. Because... Everything that Meridia is, as a, as a concept, this, this Daedric Lord of Light, of Life, of Anti, on Death, why would she give so much of her power? Why would she basically bless Umaril the Unfeathered to do all of these different things? To fight against, basically, Kinnereth. And even more so than that, I mean, we know what Umaril ended up doing in Oblivion. He wanted to desecrate, he wanted to destroy the Churches of the Nine. Or, yeah, the Churches of the Nine, I was going to say the Edmund, definitely the Nine. I didn't open the door, I think I was supposed to go somewhere else. Rip in pieces. I think I have to go all the way up again. But, um... Everything that Umaril ended up doing is kind of fucked up. If you pardon the curse word. And the fact that his main goal was... To take down the Divines. To destroy them. Like, that's... That's what Umaril wanted. And... Seemingly, Meridia was... Sort of behind that whole thing. At least partially by blessing him. Which... It's kind of confusing why a god like her, why a Daedric prince like her would want something like that. Why would she bless a person that would want something like that? Either her hatred of Kinnereth must have been great, or maybe she's just misunderstood, right? Or maybe there is some kind of sibling rivalry going on between the two that is uh, not really spoken for in, in any book or in any lore book. Those are the real questions. But those are the questions that we don't really have answers for. But that's what makes her so interesting. That we have all of these things and no answers. Let's see if we can take, ooh, take care of this guy. Between episodes, I uh, go around town to replenish my potions as much as I can. But uh, 
didn't really manage to get many this time around, so I'm actually quite afraid that uh, I might actually run out of potions during this dungeon. The last boss in this dungeon is actually pretty difficult, so I'm hoping that doesn't actually happen. And that's what I was looking for. Okay. Yeah, this boss is actually pretty difficult. Now, the weapon that we're supposed to get at the end of this dungeon is the Dawnbreaker, one of the coolest... No, you know what? It is the coolest weapon in this game. Uh, <laughs> it is um, an anti-undead weapon. It has the ability... It basically does fire damage upon hit, but also it puts an aura on the enemy whenever you hit an undead enemy. And uh, it has a chance of exploding in this sort of Nova of fire and radiant energy that destroys and fears undead in the area. It's actually really, really strong. Definitely the strongest weapon in the game if you're fighting... If you're fighting undead, and that's what we're going to be doing here now. This is a two-phase battle. Once we destroy him on his physical human form, he's going to revert back into a shadowy form. And uh, this is going to be pretty difficult. So, wish me luck in here. In fact, what I'm going to do... Uh, oh, it seems like I didn't really use much of my enchantments on this weapons. So, let's go ahead and do that. Typically what I do is I fight these monsters over here, mostly because Malkaran actually has the ability to cast really, really high level eye spells. And those spells are no joke, they'll actually probably one-shot me. So you don't want to deal with that at all. And that's why I was worried about running out of mm, healing items. Oh, you can still see me. This is going to be a nightmare. <laughs> Alright, I'm going to be a little bit distracted for a second here as I do this. Almost got him. Ooh, he almost got me too. If I can uh, become invisible enough to run, he can still see me. <laughs> okay. Yeah, invisibility is not going to do anything for me. I think we might actually have gotten him here. Can't power attack. <laughs> it's pretty slow, but we'll get him. There we go. Then he goes into his shade form, but at least uh, we should be able to just power attack him to death. Jesus. Yeah, our frost enchantments haven't really done much these past two episodes. The defiler is defeated. Take Dawnbreaker from its pedestal. I shall do that, ma'am. Let me just... Get some of these items from the Necromancer, the ghostly remains, got some gold pieces, and I don't think I necessarily want to loot anything from the Spectres. But there it is. We did it. <laughs> What's the name of the quest? The Break of Dawn. Like, it seems like uh, the Necromancer has been using the, the dead from the Civil War to kind of funnel his necromantic rituals. You can see all the the Legion warriors and then some of the Stormcloaks. It's a little bit hard to see, but if you pay close attention, you can actually see that those are Stormcloak suits that they're carrying. Which is kind of interesting. And then, of course, one of... Ow! Oh, God! One of my favorite weapons in the game, Dawnbreaker. Take the mighty Dawnbreaker 
and with it purge corruption from the dark corners of the world. Wield it in my name, that my influence may grow. Hmm. I will wield this mighty blade in your name. May the light of certitude guide your efforts. Meridia is not a Daedric prince, but indeed an Aedra living in Oblivion, which does make her a Daedra for all intents and purposes. She's using what I would imagine would be a lot of sort of Oblivion powers, Daedric powers, in order to fuel her energies, but she is indeed an Aedra. She is, uh, has Aedric blood in her veins, and that's why she is good. That's why at least she represents goodness, which is pretty dope. It's one of those things that w when I figured that out, um, it was kind of shocking, really. But I never really made a video about her. There really isn't much information other than what I basically just mentioned in this video. But um, she is just really cool. And the weapon, of course. Dawnbreaker. We're actually going to be able to use it because it is a one-handed weapon, so it works pretty well for us. Uh, it's, actually, it's also interesting that her the, the burn damage that the weapon does can actually be upgraded if you use feats such as uh, Augmented Flames. <laughs> Fire spells do 25% more damage. That actually improves the damage that Dawnbreaker does, which is kind of cool. Very nice. And there you have it, folks. Meridia's quest. Some stuff about Meridia and Meridia's sword. <laughs> Hope you all enjoyed the episode. Hope you all enjoyed a little bit of story time for Meridia. And uh, I hope to see you all next time. Be sure to leave me some questions. I will be answering, uh, answering some questions from the, uh, from the chat. Follow me on Twitter if you want to send me questions there. That's probably where I would... Uh, collect no you know what I think I think I'll, I'll think I'll be very even with that I think I'll grab some questions from Twitter and I'll grab some questions from the comment section below I want to be uh, I want to be equal with both locations I do want you guys to follow me on Twitter please my, my Twitter following is shockingly low <laughs> I don't really promote it as much as I probably should uh, so I wanna I want to start doing that a little bit more but yeah Hope that you all enjoyed the video and I'll see you all on Friday. Bye-bye.